Welcome to All About Money. As Hong Kong sinks into its first recession in a decade, the business environment becomes more challenging than ever. It's now a crucial time for companies to reflect on their modes of operation and find ways forward. Now, to discuss with us his own experience of adapting a business to catch up with the times, today we have with us Derek Wu, the CEO of lighting retailer and distributor Future Lighting. Now, Derek, welcome to the show. Uh, you uh, actually, your business started some two decades ago, right? Your uncle started Almost. it as a retail, a small retail shop. Now, before we move on to talk about how it became what it is today, why don't you tell us how it all began and what the operations were like back then? Sure. And thanks for having me first, uh, Diane. Um, my uncle started the business almost 20 years ago, um, and he founded the business just as a small lighting retailer. So what it means is we open these lighting shops in one of these uh, decorative material streets like Lockhart Road, Morrison Hill Road. Um, and the business picked up quite quickly, so he grew it from a one-shop company to, uh, at peak times, we were almost uh, eight to ten shops. Uh, and until around 2010, we uh, foresee that there would be some hardship and challenges within the retailers, especially with e-commerce and, and all these trends going on. Um, so we decided to transform the business. And that's when I came back from the UK to help with my family business. Right. So that was about 10 years ago, right? And that was after the business had survived the financial crisis and Absolutely. you took over. So what was the business like at that point when you took over and what did you have to do? I think we were slightly just coming out of the um, recession. Um, it began in 2008, for example. Um, and then in 2010, we, we saw that the, the sales and all the recovery was really slow. Um, and we were seeing rents that keep going up, you know, um, wages that keep going up. Um, so we, we, we had to find a way to diversify our business and also to reduce the risk because we were putting all our eggs into one basket. So we had to find ways to move forward. Right, so now why did your uncle bring you, so you were studying in the UK, oh no, so you were working in the UK at that sure. time, right? Your background's in IT and engineering, uh, you had some managerial experience in an IT firm, right? So what, you had nothing to do with lighting, why did he bring you back? Absolutely. I mean, I think that um, my uncle saw my um, uh, management skills, I guess, um, because he started with nothing as well. So he didn't have any... Um, I think before he started his lighting business, he actually was in uh, food and beverages. So he had this little tea house um, and then he got some money and then he saved up some money and then opened up his first shop. So he saw that, you know, he didn't have any knowledge and uh, same as me, I didn't have any knowledge of lighting, uh, but what we have is passion, I guess. <laughs> so uh, he said, oh, why don't you, he, before that, he actually uh, invited me a few times to come back, but I, I didn't feel it was the right time. But, you know, in 2010, we were, um, we were at a point that we, we, uh, we needed to uh, think of ways to move forward. So uh, I just came back. So you like the challenge, this problem solving kind of challenge. So what kind of problems did you have to solve them? What did you bring to the table? Well, at first, um, it was going from retail into uh, something else. So we had to f leverage our existing um, product knowledge, our existing network, how we can diversify our our products as well as our sales channels. Um, so we started with products first. Um, of course, we were only uh, uh, a retailer so we were mainly uh, doing decorative lighting for the residential market um, so we of course we had our, our, our suppliers um, relationships quite well already so we thought um, you know as well as having decorative lighting for residential market why don't we diversify that so uh, we started with picking up a few brands from um, going into these um, international light shows um, and um, and then you know we we uh, engaged in um, distributorship with some European brands to start with um, and then we uh, also looked at uh, lighting products um, just um, well we looked at products that that are not only to do with lighting. For example, light switches. Um, so it's it's part of your lighting system, but it's it's not as uh, 
uh, it's not just a decorative lighting piece. Um, and then we went into um, control systems and also now um, different items like fan lighting, for example, and even smart homes, um, light, uh, a smart home system like digital locks and so on. Right. Actually, speaking of smart home systems, like that must be a big step uh, from what the business was uh, some almost two decades ago. Uh, how have you seen these changes in the lighting trends? Yes, uh, definitely the trends have, have uh, changed even in just my 10 years in the lighting industry. Uh, I guess nowadays um, people are looking for more uh, simplistic and minimalistic um, um, design. So uh, a, a lot of the homes you will see is um, you no longer see the you know, centerpiece and the uh, really massive decorative item uh, in, in the center of the lounge or, the, or even the kitchen. Uh, you see these lighting coves, you see these hidden uh, uh, light sources, um, you st and with the um, introduction of LED, so everything can be hidden and not just uh, a light fixture with a light bulb, for example. So uh, the trend has definitely changed the, the, our industry. Let's talk a bit about this uh, retail business branching off into the distribution system, uh, distri distribution business, I mean. Sure. Um, what, that's a bigger part of your uh, business nowadays, right? Is it, is it a signal that retail business just isn't uh, doing so well for you guys, for maybe the renovation sort of sector? Um, what, what do you think this uh, reflects? Uh, I guess it reflects the uh, uh, downtrend in the uh, property market um, transactions. Um, we've heard numbers like it's dropped from normally the second home um, um, buying and selling transactions. Uh, it's normally around 120,000 per year, but it's gone down from from that to 80,000 and now more or less 50,000. So that's changed um, the landscape. Um, so now in, when we do lighting, we can no longer just look at home lighting, for example. Um, and that's why we diversified our product portfolio. Uh, with our product, then of course, we then need to look at channels. Um, so at first, of course, we, it was the easy piece, which means we just distribute our products to fellow retailers like us. So, but that's a limited number. As you know, Hong Kong is only seven to eight million people. So number of lighting shops in Hong Kong is only around 40 to 50 uh, max. So then we looked at these uh, little uh, electrical and hardware stores that are, you know, kind of under the, the estate or, or um, uh, you can have a small shop uh, everywhere dotted around the city. Um, so we, we fill that channel. Um, and then with our product, because um, at some point we distributed a brand which had some kids lighting and reading lamps, for example. And with those products, we could um, open up these uh, stationery shops, toy shops, for example. So we just kind of went with our product and where we see the opportunities, we just diversified into these channels. Now, one other opportunity that uh, I know you sort of grasped is uh, to start offering solutions for people, lighting solutions in ho uh, as a whole. Um, so tell us a bit about that, like this project-based kind of um, work. That's right. It's because, again, even with the distribution business, we saw there was a, a strong linkage between retail and distribution. So whenever there were downward trends in uh, property, uh, market transactions that uh, the district market the distribution market also shrank so we we needed to look outside of um, residential lighting um, so with our project lighting um, that's exactly where this new channel comes from um, so now we work with a lot of uh, interior designers architects uh, property developers prop property maintenance companies uh, and we provide not only lighting products but also lighting solutions to these companies. Um, so for example when an interior designer comes to us with, with a branded uh, retail shop that they need to uh, design and decorate and that's when we need to provide lighting solution that realizes their design and provide extra value for their customers. So you guys also need a lot of um, interior design knowledge then in terms of how you can offer solutions. So this, this wall, perhaps you could use this kind of lighting and this and that. How do you work with the interior de designers in that way? Did you have to like expand your company uh, talent pool in order to you know, do these projects? How, how did you go about it? I wouldn't say our technical people are um, uh, interior designers, uh, as it were, but 
Absolutely, they need to have a sense of um, design um, in order to um, uh, put the right lighting into the right uh, environment. Um, and yes, they do, uh, our technical people, we, we had to expand that that team um, in order to provide a, a technical and professional solution. So nowadays, not, we don't, like, like I said before, we don't only provide a product. Sometimes we provide a lot of consultancy as well. So we do lux calculation. Lux is a, a measurement of brightness. So um, we, we, we provide these um, technical diagrams for them. And also, um, for example, when we decorate out a cosmetic shop, um, they have very um, high demands of lighting. So uh, the color temperature, for example, is uh, something that they care about. So our technical people would um, really have to know how to, to give them the right solution. All right, that's really interesting. Now, let's uh, talk a bit more about your talent pool when we come back. Uh, okay. Stay tuned. We'll be right back after the break. Thank you. Welcome back to All About Money. We're talking with Derek Wu, CEO of Future Lighting, about modernizing his family business in the face of economic difficulties. Now, Derek, let's uh, first talk about change. That's difficult, right? Especially when it comes to the older generations and technology. So when you took over the business uh, with your IT background, I imagine you must have put in operationally and in terms of business direction, uh, different uh, systems and technologies. Uh, how was that for you? Was there resistance? Uh, how did you overcome all that? I was actually quite lucky because when I came back, the retail business remained intact. So um, it wasn't a, a much of a challenge for me to really uplift that and then change everything in that business first. Um, my priority was to diversify the business into the distribution and project channels. So I started from nothing. So that was you know, when you build Lego, everything, uh, you know, from nothing ground up, then it's easier to dismantle everything and to rebuild it. Um, so that that way, I, I put in first, of course, a uh, computer system, which is uh, um, an enterprise resource planning system. And also because we uh, were um, looking into the into the future of really upscaling our distribution business so we had to put in an efficient um, warehouse management system to manage all our stock um, so once all that went in of course you know it's it takes time and uh, and many iterations of, of, of um, reviews and, and and improvements and Probably after one and a half year uh, from the beginning, then we started to have a spoof uh, operation. Uh, and once all the systems are put in, then you need to think about, you know, like I said, the products and then the channels and so on. Yeah. All right. So in terms of taking over an old business operation, like what? How do you know what to keep? I mean, you said the retail side basically you just kept intact and kept going right but at I the beginning yes. at the beginning but you still you know you try to move it online and do e-commerce and things like that so how do you know what in terms of business operations what to keep and what to change how do you make those decisions again i think with a bit of luck because when we dis when we um diversified into the distribution business uh, of course our retailers our own shops were also our customers um, so with that and also like you said the the, tr the new trends of online and e-commerce uh, and with uh, buzzwords like uh, you know online to offline that kind of thing then we can quite easily link back to our retail business um, so with all those new trends and like even a simple thing like putting a, a, up a website um, of course, we had resistance and uh, and we had difficulty uh, when uh, our new staff need to learn to to uh, adapt to the new system. Um, but yes, after hard hard work and after of course timing and care, then uh, you know soon it, it it just became operational. Right. So let's talk a bit about challenges of a family business. Like, I mean, it's it's good fortune that you had uh, this opportunity within your family to do it. But I imagine there must be challenges there as well, working with family. So give us a bit about that. 
Absolutely, uh, um, and I, I guess I was uh, again. I, I'm blessed to to have the trust of my uncle. Um, I guess it's to do with uh, being the first child in in my family, uh, in my mo mother's side of the family. Um, so I've I've always grown up to to kind of look after other smaller cousins. Um, so um, again, over the years, and uh, I've I've had. Um, uh, 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 different chats and, and, and different uh, encounters with my uncle and, and once we, you've built up that trust that really helps you in, in uh, uh, letting my uncle uh, or, or my uncle letting me to, to get on with, with the job and, and trust me in making decisions and, and moving things forward. Right now, in terms of your staff, I understand that you do have uh, quite the, one of your business philosophies is to uh, prioritize your human capital, the human assets. Uh, right. Tell us how you, you know, why and how you prioritize your employees. I guess it has to do a little bit with my uh, background in working overseas. Um, when I was in the UK, I, I worked largely for blue chip companies, and I, I saw. Of course, now it's very different because we, uh, when we when I came back, we were uh, we were really just uh, a small business. Uh, so in terms of resources and 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 staff, as it were, it, it, you can't really compare. Um, and you don't have the same resources to do to do the same uh, policies and, and same benefits as it were for for a company but my my uh, aim was that you know you don't need to do you don't need to be Rome in one day you, you can do it bit by bit so um, I guess from my experience in in the UK work I, I saw that once you 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 treat your employee well then they often treat your customers and the company as a family so um, so we started putting in policies we started um, giving bit by bit um, you know when we can afford it um, uh, small benefits then um, and again it's building that trust once your employee has that trust with the company and has that loyalty to the company then everything everything kind of just gel together and everyone works as a team and then again things can move forward quite quickly. Well, what kind of policies when you say that you put in policies to uh, to prioritize your staff uh, what kind of policies are you talking about? Uh, from small things to big things so for example just like uh, even annual leaves um, I, I, when I first came back I was surprised in terms of number of days of leave that people get in in Hong Kong compared to you know the standard days in in the UK for example uh, and the different types of leave um, so like I said bit by bit we started putting in birthday leave passionately compassionate leave all that kind of stuff first and also um, you know flexible working hours all, all those kind of uh, nitty-gritty all these small bits you kind of s slowly build it up and then into a, 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 a bigger policy as it were well I mean I've heard you talk about work-life balance you know j not just you but also your staff but Hong Kong is notorious for crazy long working hours mm. how do you as a business stay competitive with this kind of um, policies that uh, help your employees have a life I was quite adamant that when I even when I first started I I I told my staff even when I hired them that uh, things are going to be different so uh, even on on the retail side at the same time they they had to work long hours you know shop hours basically it was uh, 11 to 9 p.m. 11 a.m. to 9 p.m. Um, but my philosophy was uh, if you work hard and if you work smart then you don't need to be in the office you know for whatever time that are fixed in order to do the job so uh, I look at results basically rather than the time spent in the office um, so once that mentality or the culture that you you've built up then it kind of just spreads right hiring can be a real headache in Hong Kong this is generally in all sectors uh, is an issue so has this um, program of uh, treating your staff well and building staff loyalty to the company has it helped retain staff really and uh, and or even hire staff absolutely not just retaining but but yes absolutely in in terms of hiring uh, I, I'll tell you a good story about um, two of my marketing employees um, um, that we luckily got uh, it was uh, recommended by a 
uh, one of our project sales uh, person that was studying at uh, 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 part time at a university, um, you know, during uh, 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 sorry after work hours, and they had these two. Um, uh, students that that were studying in the same program with him uh, that wanted to look for a summer job summer internship um, so at first we hired these two uh, young uh, uh, people into our company to to do um, basic stuff like uploading pictures into website doing administrative work basically um, and then after the summer intern we saw uh, how passionate they were so we we kept them on so uh, of course they were doing part-time so they could come maybe Monday Wednesday and Friday um, and and that's lasted for about two years and then after they graduated they joined our company and nice. and formed our marketing team um, so that tells us uh, uh, a, a great story of um, our colleagues recommending open positions to their friends and families and that kind of hiring is is something quite uh, strong Right. Now, I understand that you also do a lot of charity work and you get your staff involved as well. Sure. Uh, tell us why and what kind of charities you do. Okay. Um, I guess it's to do with... Um, we, we started this uh, five or six years ago um, when we... Um, again, it's to, uh, it's to do with our business strategy. We, we knew that by distributing other people's brands, um, it's, uh, in terms of su sustainability, um, we were vulnerable basically. Um, so we needed to build up our own brand, for example. Uh, and all that kind of um, CSR, CSV work, is, it's, it's to do with that. Basically building up a company's mission, vision, and, and the culture and the brand. Um, so yes, uh, we, we started to engage. Um, again, everything started from small. Um, we looked into the Caring Company program in Hong Kong. Uh, we just looked for two local charities. Uh, the reason behind that was we, we thought, oh, maybe just over lunchtime, our colleagues can, can go together to these uh, uh, charities nearby and, and you know do one or two hours help. Um, and then we expanded that into close relationship with these charities and expanded into different uh, marketing campaigns and marketing programs. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it started from something small. All right. Uh, you, you're speaking of sustainability as well. That's something that your company engages a lot in. How do you as a lighting company promote sustainability? Two years ago, we worked with uh, a charity called WGO, World Green Organization. Uh, we organized a citywide um, Again, started from some something simple of a uh, photography um, competition. So we went to schools, we went to uh, even some general public, and uh, over the I think few months we had uh, over I think seven hundred um, applications or, or, or um, entries. Um, and each entry we would donate some money to to the charity and it started from that but now it's it expanded into a, a ongoing program where we ask our some of our suppliers to donate unwanted goods these goods would otherwise go to landfills um, they, they're not uh, energy inefficient products they're just probably uh, outdated and and uh, because of these uh, big brands KPI they they need to move them out of the, the warehouse um, so we had these donations and then we also saw these um, energy saving light bulbs had to be replaced uh, environmentally uh, because they contain mercury so we thought oh one bird, two stones. So um, we have these two free gifts. Stone, sorry, two birds, <laughs> two birds, right. one stone. Sorry, um, we had these uh, new LED light bulbs in exchange for a uh, uh, less environmental friendly energy saving light bulb. People can bring in their old light bulb in exchange for a new one, um, all free of charge. And also, we could spread the knowledge. Uh, as well as that, we we provide now a lot of lighting seminars to, to these um, different um, parts of societies just to teach them more about uh, uh, energy saving lighting. Right, so that's part of all part of your program. Absolutely. It's really interesting your journey from you know ten years ago to now. Uh, thanks so much for joining us, Derek. You, that man. was uh, Future Lighting CEO Derek Wu with us today. And with that, we wrap up this edition of All About Money. We'll be back with more next week here on HKIBC. See you then.